from the vault. Uh, we have sealed the gates, yes. Welcome to the news for the week of 15 March 2020. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, basically, plague surveillance may be coming your way soon, if you imagine that. The U.S. government is afraid of cryptocurrency. D-bags attack the HHS in time of disease and new attacks on Android phones. All this free toilet paper. And Jason Wood will join us for excellent commentary on phishing scams on this edition of Security Weekly News. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Make sure your team is prepared to fight off the latest cybersecurity threat. IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team skills up to date. You can stream IT Pro TV courses live and on demand, so there's no need to send staff to off-site training. Team subscriptions include Pro Portal, so managers have full control over your team's training schedule. Go to itpro.tv slash hack naked and use the code HN30 to try it free for seven days and receive 30% off your monthly membership. Well, we're not shut down, but we are staying uh, at home. So this is being broadcast from my studio, which is why I look so sexy. Um, all right, let's get to the news. Uh, all the news is fit to print about cybersecurity. The U.S. government is showing increasing interest in cryptocurrencies. If you recall last month, Chinese nationals were charged with money laundering, and apparently there's an increased focus on the use of cryptocurrencies for both uh, legal and illegal activity in, uh, in both the United States and the world. U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin testified in February that the Treasury Department would be introducing stricter regulations to somehow try and manage illegal activities uh, involving cryptocurrency. He said uh, his goal was to ensure that law enforcement can see where money is flowing. Usually language like that gets a lot of people kind of up in arms. Uh, in addition to that, the IRS has now issued guidance in a special form. Imagine a special form from the IRS. But they've issued guidance that you must disclose any income involving virtual currency transactions. Uh, this is a great article that I put in a wiki about this topic with them talking about the U.S. The title of the article was about the U.S. getting involved in blockchaining, but they it really didn't talk that much about blockchaining. It was talking more about them wanting to address uh, cryptocurrencies uh, at the in the U.S. and obviously the governments of the world don't much like cryptocurrencies or blockchaining unless they control it. So a lot of people on both sides uh, of those topics. Well, the U.S. government then, in particular, the Senate voted to extend three surveillance powers that are used by federal law enforcement. So this stuff like FISA. Uh, allows government law enforcement agencies to fight terrorism. And there was a lot of controversy about these bills, which were put in place back around 9-11, because a lot of people were saying, we don't care, anything goes, suspend my rights, whatever you need to do in order to get me uh, safe. And this was coming up for renewal before all the other chaos that's going on started. And... Um, Basically, it was thought that the Senate was going to revise some of these controversial, uh, there was three of these controversial uh, rules, but they extended them now for 75 more days. Uh, basically, they allow the FBI to obtain court orders to collect business records on individuals who are under uh, national security investigation. So that means that they don't necessarily have to have probable cause to get those. I'm not an attorney, so don't consider this legal advice. Uh, it also allows, there's another one that allows roving wiretaps, which means they can just jump from phone to phone to phone, uh, doing it, surveillance on people extensively. And another part of this, which allows monitoring of individuals who don't have any ties at all to international terrorism, which that actually makes sense to me because there's plenty of people that are terrorists who are not necessarily international. But obviously, depending on you, these may seem ominous or they may seem great. Uh, different people have different points of views, and it's not my job to tell you what that point of view should be. But this was a complicated uh, set of uh, discussions going on about surveillance in the United States. 
And it's always uh, been a very controversial issue in the United States when we talk about government surveillance in general. Uh, all of these acts were passed in the wake of 9-11, and they've all been controversial, and there's been a lot of calls for them to be revised. But high levels of surveillance uh, in China, South Korea, and Israel have allowed for tracking precision movements of individuals in the current pandemic. So through the use of facial recognition and cell phones and so forth, they've been able to very carefully track the movement of people in those countries and as, as a consequence, reduce the impact of the pandemic. So much like 9-11, there is a lot of pressure from people coming to suspend rights, to increase surveillance on the general public, and you know, calling for the need for that. And who knows uh, what may come along. So, so far, the United States has not moved in that direction. And general public opinion of surveillance, uh, particularly facial recognition, surveillance, and tracking are not very popular. So uh, at this point, it did not seem that the Congress or anybody else was getting ready to jump on the bandwagon of uh, Chinese-style surveillance. And I don't know how popular that would be. But these same cases that came out of all this stuff did result in some domestic arrests. Uh, two men in Michigan were arrested for food stamp fraud, which resulted from surveillance under the various acts where they were looking for international terrorism incidents and so forth. But basically, the agency said, if we see crime, we have to investigate it. I mean, that that makes sense to the, you know, if I put the law enforcement hat on and say, well, you know, that makes sense. If you walk into a place because there was a noise complaint and there's bricks of cocaine on the table, you might have to do something about that. Um, but using these anti-terrorism surveillance acts, according to ACLU, can basically be used to circumvent the Fourth Amendment. If you're unaware, the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution provides for privacy uh, and protection from law enforcement, you know, basically investigating you. But regardless of how you feel about either side of this issue, and different people have, have you know, very different opinions about it, it is an interesting story to read, uh, and, and I did enjoy it. Um, of course, in the scum of the earth category of the week, uh, apparently, the Department of Health and Human Services was experiencing some unusual activity on Sunday night. Uh, it wasn't a hack, it, but apparently it was a, a, a distributed denial of service attack. Someone was trying to execute against HHS. If you aren't aware, HHS is the branch of the U.S. government health and human services that is responsible for, well, health and, and, and human services. And, you know, so... Um, not really exactly. It's kind of like, you know, let's go take out the hospital when all hell is breaking loose. But um, so that was why I, I call them D-bags in the, in the title. Apparently, according to C the, uh, CISA, the attack was not particularly successful. And I did include a, a section of commentary talking about this attack and its impact. Cyber attacks are certainly going to be more common uh, as, as we go more pe as more people go online, especially as we see strains on the networks that are going on, I think we're going to have a lot more users who are going to be unfamiliar, unpracticed, and struggling to do their jobs remotely. So we definitely need to be vi vigilant and supportive of, of all these efforts as cybersecurity professionals. So keep all that in mind and, and be patient with some of the new people that are that are joining us for the first time online. Uh, in the world, and they're going to be heavy targets, of course, as well. Domain Tools noted an Android app that provides COVID-19 tracking for users, but is, wait for it, ransomware. It locks a phone using COVID lock, and it basically threatens to erase your data, leak your data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if a $100 Bitcoin ransom is not paid. So also in the, the D-bag category, uh, releasing something that, you know, people that are scared and desperate are going to use as ransomware, you know, but I mean, that's, that's how it works. So uh, you might as well get used to that idea. And if that Android news wasn't bad enough, a new type of Android stalkerware can install itself on the system partition of an Android phone and then proceed to steal the hashes uh, for the screen unlock pattern, you know, that one of those, uh, if you just, if you're using those screen unlock pattern for you make a symbol, uh, I'm making a pentagram, um, uh, unlocks a, a pattern on, or a password. Uh, the particular software malware is called Monitor Miner, 
And it does target both the login, but it also targets applications like Gmail or pretty much any kind of communications app that is on the phone. It does run as root. So that it, it, it has to get that access, but it has built into it a way to do that. Um, it's used primarily for credential mining, but it can also capture conversations and will probably very soon be a component of ransomware as well. It's basically a sophisticated keylogger, but it has primarily been targeting India. But there are now like I, there was like 11 percent of the infections were now being uh, reported in Germany. And so it is spreading on Android phones uh, all over the place uh, around the world. Um, my last note here uh, is, is just to tell you to use extreme caution with your users and friends in terms of COVID-19 scams. Uh, I know Jason is going to talk about uh, COVID phishing in particular, but I have already seen and been contacted about a lot of them. And I'm sure there's going to be more running soon uh, from every possible aspect. Um, these guys are going to adapt uh, and attack your users, uh, you know, with offers of toilet paper, with offers of information, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that is going to be very challenging as we get a lot of people using online systems that have never used them before in the past. I, I know at all the, I mean, every university in, in the United States and maybe the world is closed uh, for the first time. So be advised. And when we, so when we return, uh, we will welcome Jason Wood, who will join us from his safe haven and will be providing expert commentary about COVID-19 phishing scams. So stick around. As technology continues to evolve and expand, so have the countless ways our critical systems can be put in jeopardy. Ransomware attacks, misconfiguration, user error, and malicious threat actors, to name a few. As IT infrastructures continue to grow and diversify, how do you ensure stable security? Core Security, a help systems company, provides an analytics-driven, layered approach to security with a portfolio that enables both proactive and reactive responses. With Core Security, you can reduce risk by limiting access, detect upcoming and active threats, test for security weaknesses, and and efficiently monitor data for actionable insights. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash core security. And now live from the vaults, uh, multiple vaults, we're not in the same vault, so we all have to have our own separate vaults because you know, social isolationism and all that good stuff. Although no one is more prepared to deal with social isolation than me. But maybe another person, despite his, his immense charisma, is, is Jason Wood, who joins us now with his expert commentary. Jason, thanks for being here in, in these dark times. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been interesting. And I, my wife and I were joking around about the, uh, the the changes of people working from home and stuff like that. And I said, well, I've been practicing at this for 13 years, so... Uh, Still sticking in my, in my in my normal hideout. Uh, so as Doug said, yeah, we, I was going to take a look at some of the active phishing campaigns that are occurring around coronavirus, and I guess you could call this the the D bag episode of of Security Weekly News. Um, <laughs> we've we've got lots of them out there. Uh, I thought this was interesting to bring up for a couple of reasons. One, we've got uh, just the attackers using coronavirus as their lure now, but we also have more and more people working from home. They're new to this. They've never done it before. They've done it very, very occasionally. And uh, this is going to be a new thing for a lot of folks. And add on to that, they have all of the pressure and, and, and fear and stuff like that associated with uh, what's happening with this virus and what does that mean. So, I, you know, I suspect folks are going to be feeling a little isolated, looking for information, uh, being definitely hungry for information about coronavirus and anything they can do to protect themselves or get information about what, you know, where they can get access to resources or whatnot. As a result, they're going to be more likely to open emails and provide data that they may not normally do uh, because of the sensitivity around this topic and their, their worries. So maybe here are some stories that you can use inside of your organizations to maybe do a little security awareness uh, messages out there. And I realize I'm saying send this out probably via email, and we're talking about phishing scams. But uh, you know you want to provide folks with some information about it. And I'm a proponent of the idea of hey, make the story uh, real and uh, relevant to our users to be more useful. So first off, we've got this article here from Bitdefender titled, Phishing Email 
uh, aims to trick hospital staff with coronavirus seminar and basically details a campaign that's going on right there out there right now to steal credentials from healthcare workers. So they are specifically targeting the healthcare industry and stating that they are requiring employees to take training about coronavirus. They're adding a lot of pressure to the to the users, threats of disciplinary action if they don't sign in to take this training. Uh, you know, the usual urgency type of stuff. They still have the various spelling errors and grammar issues and whatnot. But that is being tossed out there to folks. And as you can imagine, the healthcare workers I are, are under a lot of pressure. I actually talked to a friend of mine last night who's an ER doctor. And, uh, you know, some of what he's experiencing, these, these folks are really feeling under the gun. And so with that pressure that they're experiencing, these folks are also likely to click on links that they, they wouldn't normally do. In this case, uh, it actually, according to the article, a for example, a Czech hospital, it was a university hospital, was targeted with this. It worked well enough that their network was locked up with ransomware. They are now canceling surgeries, sending people to other hospitals for treatment, Oh, and by the way, they were a maging testing or lab environment for COVID-19 in, uh, in their country. Uh, that gets pretty grim when you, you have those systems locked up. Obviously, the attackers have no scruples about this, and they're, they're going right for where it hurts. So that's a story to, il to use to illustrate to your folks of, of what folks are doing right now. Um, I also saw some tweets that I thought were worth bringing up. Um, about some of the fishing observations they have around fishing. Uh, Ray Bango, uh, and I have the link to this in the notes, show notes, sent a message out today, earlier day, stating, please be extra careful opening any coronavirus slash COVID-19 related emails. There is a ton of phishing campaigns going on by miscreants capitalizing the situation, end quote. In response, Rich sent me, another Twitter user, replied to that with some statistics. He went and did some analysis on his organization and the emails they're saying, he says, I ran some numbers on our systems and have seen a 900% plus increase over the past month with malicious emails with coronavirus or COVID in the content or subject. Attackers are trying to capitalize, end quote. So definitely the attackers are extremely busy out there targeting everybody about this. They want to take advantage of it and not to be left out are the nation states Threat Post has an article as well about APT 36 taps coronavirus as a golden opportunity, in quotes, to spread the crimson, spread crimson, crimson rat. Boy, if I could talk. Now, for those not familiar with APT 36 or Mythic Leopard, as they're also known, their group associated with Pakistan, thought to be sponsored by the, the government of Pakistan. And their, their goal and aim is to actively target India, uh, their defense embassies and other government entities that they have, they're sending out the usual host of, of messages, again, with uh, content and subject lines and things like that about coronavirus or COVID-19, trying to get people to open up the usual list of Excel documents, uh, malicious rich text uh, RTF documents and, and Word docs and things like that that have macros and whatnot embedded into them. Uh, though the Crimson Rat utility allows uh, the uh, the attackers to capture things like credentials and uh, disable security products, take screenshots, you know, remote access, that all of that sort of stuff that you would expect with a rat. Now, uh, with all of that news, I mean, these are just some examples of things that we could put in some emails to our users and say, hey, here's what's occurring right now in relation to this. Be careful. Um, but I wanted to add another little bit of a note here um, because this is going to add pressure to us. Obviously, we all in security are subject to all of the same pressures and fears about ourselves, family members, friends, and things like that. Uh, we're, we are going to feel all of the same heat everybody else is, but we also are going to have to remain vigilant and working because the attackers are continuing to uh, their activities and stepping up in particular in this area to focus on this particular area. So take care of yourselves and your loved ones first, obviously. We've got to do that. Otherwise, we can't 
really be effective at anything. Uh, and then just make sure you're prepared to keep working, uh, whether you're remote or not, to detect and respond to attacks that are occurring out there. We're going to see a lot of activity, like Doug said. I, I agree. I think we're going to see a lot of this. Um, so be aware, take care of yourself, and, and just make sure you're prepared and ready to go. Oh, me? Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I've been wanting to wear that thing forever, so I finally got to put it on on camera. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Jason. Um, so, finally, uh, the struggle is real. Nintendo, Xbox, PlayStation, Steam, you name it, uh, they're all struggling to man. I don't know about struggling, but they're, they're definitely seeing the rise in traffic uh, as they try to manage the large uptick in online gaming. And I will comment that when Cambridge closed in 1666 due to the plague, Isaac Newton went home and basically wrote his treatise, uh, you know, outlining uh, integral calculus and differential calculus or something like that. And he also scribbled down some notes that ended up leading to Newtonian physics. But for the rest of us online gaming, well, why not? Uh, but hopefully all the networks uh, that we support, et cetera, will be up to the task. And as everybody joins in on the isolationist lifestyle uh, that some of us have always enjoyed. But as Jason said, I think we all need to be very vigilant that uh, we, we both help our friends and families and keep, uh, keep up on this because uh, the scam people actually have absolutely no, uh, no problem at all jumping on this and taking advantage of the elderly, taking advantage of anyone they can take advantage of. That's just part of doing that. So with that, from the bunker, I, I'm Doug White. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Security Weekly News. I will be back on Friday with the Security Weekly News wrap up. So be safe and uh, we'll see you then. Thanks, bye.